Hello again there, neighbors and naysayers. This is Clint Finney for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council virtual pasture walk for October the 22nd, 2020. This month, we went off to Stark County to visit with Mr. Rick Horner. So let's get started. I'm Rick Horner. We're standing here uh, with our registered Angus herd in the background. Uh, I was asked to give a little background. We, uh, we've been in the registered Angus business since 1965. Uh, we primarily are selling uh, breeding stock to commercial cattlemen and women around the Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia region. Uh, primarily uh, bulls and uh, bred females. And uh, we're out here doing a, doing a pasture walk to look at our rotational grazing system that we use uh, currently where we rotate cows into paddocks typically every day, um, along with all their calves. I do want to thank Rick for giving us that great introduction. Uh, that's not something that we expect out of everybody that does our virtual pasture walks. So we go out to visit for virtual pasture walks. Uh, but Rick is in sales and he was willing to, to have us record him on camera, giving an overview of his operation. And we do appreciate it. Uh, it's nice to have the producer and have their input on, on their own operation and, and, and have them introduce us in their own words. Uh, as I said, it's not something we require of everybody that holds a virtual pasture walk. When we come out to do a virtual pasture walk, we first talk with a landowner. Are, are you willing to talk on camera? Are you willing to have a conversation with us on camera? Or, or do you want us to avoid you at all costs? And, and we have producers that, that take any, of, any and all of those options when we go out to visit them. But, just wanted to talk a minute about the cow herd as well. Um, Rick said they used to participate in the bull tests, um, I think both here in Ohio and, and one that was also done out west that, that was kind of done regionally. They, they sent a, a truck through the northeast United States and picked up cattle at several different locations and sent them out to a bull test. I believe he said it was in Montana. But um, for those of you that don't know about bull tests, bull tests are, are a, a way that Producers would send their young bull calves to a test station and they would run those bulls either on feed or on forage uh, and evaluate them for feed efficiency and, and ultrasound and do all kinds of measurements and uh, average daily gains and things on them. And, and it's something that, that I kind of see there aren't many of them left. There are a few, but there aren't many left in the United States. And it was a, it was a way for producers to market their bulls and also to get data back on on their bulls and their cattle uh, to be able to use it for their cow herd and make their cow herd better. Uh, but it was a, a good way to market animals and, and kind of build up a business of selling bulls or breeding stock to other producers. And so Rick and his family utilized that. And, and as those things have kind of dried up, he's been able to keep uh, bull customers. Uh, and be able to sell the registered Angus uh, seed stock to other producers. While we're on this topic, I think what, what was interesting to me is, as I listened um, was that uh, I, I don't normally talk about cow numbers. I don't care whether you have five cows or 500 cows when we come out to do a virtual pasture walk. Um, but in, in Rick's operation, he, he's got 25 or 30 cows and I think it's interesting to point that out because I so often work with producers who are interested in producing seed stock, bulls, red heifers, heifers in general, uh, for other operations. And they think they need to be uh, big. They think they need to be a big operation, 50, 60, 100 cows or, or more. And, and I thought it was interesting to point out that the Rick is doing it and doing a good job of it with, with 25 or 30 cows. Now, I'm not saying that's a small cow herd. I, I, I don't, like I said, I don't care whether it's five or 500. I'm just saying that he, he's able to produce a quality product with 25 or 30 cows. He, he doesn't need to be, he doesn't have to be bigger. Uh, he's still able to produce quality bulls and quality heifers uh, with 25 or 30 cows and get them marketed to other producers. And as I talk with Rick, um, being he's in Stark County and, and I'm down here in Jefferson, Harrison County. He knew a lot of producers that we work with down here because he'd sold bulls to them over the years and a lot of them were repeat customers. Uh, so just an interesting part to point out that if you're interested in, in producing seed stock, it doesn't really mean that you have to be a large producer. 
Uh, you can be a medium-sized producer and still produce quality uh, seed stock for other operations. As we should at every pasture walk, I want to talk a minute about the pasture composition out there, their operation. Um, largely white clover, bluegrass, orchard grass, pasture fields. Uh, and we're going to talk some more about how those pasture fields come to be and, and also what their preferred version of, of pasture is and, and what they're working toward managing and working toward planting in some of these pasture fields. But uh, largely white clover, bluegrass, orchard grass, kind of mixed pasture fields. Um, and managing in, in a way that allows those plants to thrive. And so often I, I think we don't think about what forages we want to have on our operation and managing our grazing in such a way that produces those kinds of forages, that, that keeps those kinds of forages thriving. And now that I'm, I'm saying this, I'm realizing in this picture, we've also got some red clover, uh, there's some other varieties of forages out there, and we'll, we're going to look at some other things. Um, but it's an interesting point. We, we need to, to manage our pastures in such a way to allow the forages we want to grow to, to actually be there. And, and we'll also get some undesirable species at times uh, by managing that way. And, and that's where we need to maybe change our management a little bit or do some other management things. Uh, to, to keep us from getting the undesirable type forages, um, the things that we may not want. And, and I'm not saying they're undesirable to everybody, they're just undesirable to some folks. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. We're standing here in a field that Rick's cows currently are in, uh, but this is a field that he was is planning on planting to rye here yet this fall. He actually was planning on planting it to rye a, a lot sooner than this, uh, but with all of us, um, the dry weather this summer has kind of set plans back a little bit. He didn't really want to kill a field that was growing forage to plant something in it that may not get enough rain to get it to grow. So the plan still is to plant this field to rye, and so he's kind of letting the cows graze this one a little tighter than, than we would normally allow them to graze it, uh, just because he knows he's going to be killing this forage out to be able to plant rye. But the plan here is to plant rye yet this fall, graze the rye early spring, uh, then plant sorghum sedan grass in this field, and then roll it over to a, a pasture mix uh, that is more desirable for them. This is the before picture of that field. Uh, the guys up at Stark sent me this picture just to give us an overview of where we were going to and what we were going to be seeing. And I thought it was interesting to, to include in this pasture walk, but uh, composition here again, red clover, white clover, bluegrass, orchard grass. Uh, but this is the beginning graze before they turn the cows in uh, and graze. And as I said, they're trying to graze this field off uh, so that then they can then plant rye for spring grazing next spring. As always, best good at getting uh, pictures, overview of the farm and, and things. And when I get back and I look through the photos, I say, oh yeah, I need to talk about that. And with this picture here, one thing that I, I wanted to talk about was Rick also is a row crop producer. He's got some corn and some soybeans, although we didn't talk with him hardly at all about his corn and, and soybeans because we were there to look at pasture fields and, and to walk the pasture fields and talk about the cow herd. So, um, but this is a good picture to talk about pasture cropping. Um, we talked about the field there that he's planning to plant the rye and then the sorghum sedan. And um, on this overview shot, Rick has the soils, the slope, uh, and the ability to be able to go out there and plant those fields to different annuals to be able to graze them to help get his cow herd through a time of need. And I thought it was an interesting point to point out. You know, we have Dennis Brown from Byron Seed come to, to talk at our winter pasture walk meetings every couple of years. And, and Dennis always talks about sorghum sedan and ryegrass and other, what we would normally consider cover crop type species that would be planted specifically to graze or to harvest forage from. So 
just interesting to point out a, a very good farm that is conducive to planting those annuals and, and be able to graze them and get us through a time of need. And I, I would encourage you all, as I've been encouraging you all year, um, if you've got the ability and you've got the soils and the place and the time, uh, to go out and plant some annuals to help get us through those summer dry periods or the winter time when forages aren't growing very well. Um, I think all of us could could look at that and, and have some fields that, that we could definitely plant to annuals to help get us through those times of need. Uh, I know at my operation, even though I, I live down here in the hills, um, I've got several places kind of picked out that hey if we're grazing this at the right time in the right place let's think about putting some annuals in those fields just to help us get through the grazing season most of rick's fences are either one strand poly wire or one strand electric galvanized type wire and this is because he makes all of these fields for hay at certain times of the year depending on uh, growth and how much extra forage they have. He can make pasture up old defensive and make the whole field for hay. And it would become important too if we're going to do any kind of pasture cropping. You can roll the fence up and be able to plant whatever you want in it and put the fence back to be able to keep the cows in or, or have paddock division. So it's kind of an interesting point because uh, we have so many producers that talk about uh, paddock divisions and they want hard paddock divisions and and these are sort of semi-permanent fences uh, he puts them in in the spring and they're usually there all year long but it's flexible in that he can take them up and be able to make the field for hay as needed or, or plant it down to something as needed and uh, be able to still have a paddock rotation or, or you can take one field one fence out and, and have a bigger paddock if need be and, and that's a perfectly okay system. Uh, I think that we have to have some flexibility in our grazing systems. We have to have some temporary fence, but it's okay to have some sort of semi-permanent fences to be able to, to rely on them as pastures. And, and as I design grazing systems, I try to design a system that's several hard pastures that then can be split up into smaller pastures as needed. Um, but then all of this fence is polywire, but it's charged from the outside exterior fence. The exterior fence is hot, high tensile, and so all these polywires hook in directly to that polywire fence. And then the gates out toward the laneway uh, hook into the polywire, and that's where they get their charge from. So if you unhook those from the polywire, then the gate is cold. And so that's a, an important point to point out. Uh, if we're going to, to design a grazing system, we need to think about how are we going to get those temporary fences charged and, and get a, a, an electric charge in those polywire fences. Um, it, it's important to sit down with a map and kind of look over the farm and how are we going to keep each one of those fences hot when we need it to be hot. <laughs> Just a good picture of a polywire reel, and uh, Rick's got this one hooked uh, to a T post and hanging there. Um, just a good picture to show that we don't always need uh, really fancy gear reels to be able to, to operate a, a grazing system. This is just a straight uh, polywire reel, sort of inexpensive, um, and has polywire enough on it to be able to do other things with it if he needs to. Uh, I will say that that yellow and black polywire isn't my favorite. If you get along with it, that's fine. But um, Rick and I had a conversation there about the white polywire and how he likes it. And he has the, the black and yellow that he really doesn't like, but he gets a season or two out of it. And sometimes it does in a pinch. But um, just a good picture to show that it doesn't take um, real expensive polywire and and step in posts and all those things to be able to make a grazing system go uh, kind of an inexpensive grazing system and we, we don't need all that fancy stuff they're nice they sure are nice to have some of those geared reels and, and really good poly wire and really great step in posts um, but in this kind of semi-permanent type paddock division uh, we don't have to have that ease of reeling it up we don't have to have the ease of getting the fence posts out so uh, a good system to be able to, to operate and, and keep a sort of a semi-permanent type paddock vision. I think it's also important to, to point out that um, Rick said when we got out of the car, 
that people are amazed that he's able to keep his his animals in with as much one strand polywire as he has all over the farm and and we talked about that i, I think it's important to note that uh, so often we design grazing systems and the farmer wants a two or three strand fence for cattle and, and it's not really necessary um for one if the calves get into another paddock that's perfectly fine um one they're going to creep graze and, and get some better stuff uh two they'll eventually learn that that fence is going to shock them and, and that's a good training opportunity as well um, but we have to remember that we're working with a psychological barrier not a physical barrier and so often i mean especially when we're dealing with cows there, there's no end to how much of a physical barrier we'd have to have to keep some cattle behind their fence. Uh, but this psychological barrier keeps our livestock in where we need it to, we need them to. And, and it's also important to point out that Rick said, you know, I'm going to move cows every day and they know I'm going to move them every day. So they're not upset and they're not pushing the fence because they know come five o'clock, he's going to be out there to move cows anyhow. And, and that's an important point to point out as well. Um, our cows, our sheep, or whatever we're grazing, they learn when that paddock shift is going to happen. And so they get used to that. And so they don't want to push fences because they know they're going to be getting a new field. It's something I had to do with our sheep. That's why we move them every day because I know if I move them every day, I don't have to worry about them pushing on fences. And, and it's important to point out as well because our, our animals learn when they're going to be moved. And it's important to stay on that schedule. Uh, if we're moving them every day, we need to move them every day because that's what they're used to. That's what they'll learn and that's how they'll graze forage. If we happen to leave them for an extra day in a field, um, that that's gonna upset their sort of schedule and their grazing routine for that particular field. But interesting point to point out that uh, we can get by with one strand polywire and hold 25 or 30 cows back and, and as long as we're moving them every day, it can still work for us. You may have noticed in that last video that there was a significant amount of alfalfa in that field. That's not something we typically see on a grazing operation. We don't see a lot of alfalfa or almost a pure stand of alfalfa. And I thought it was good to stop and talk about it for just a minute. Um, alfalfa is perfectly fine to be grazed. There are grazing varieties of alfalfa. There are forage trials out there that tell us what the best versions of grazing alfalfa are. Um, but Rick has alfalfa in a lot of his fields, or especially the ones that we looked at, and, and that's because he's harvesting it for hay and selling that alfalfa hay, or he's harvesting it for hay for a need for when they wean calves or, or when a particular group of cows needs a better forage. And um, alfalfa can work for us in a field. Rick says he, he uses some bloat blocks and bloat preventers. Uh, he uses bloat preventers in some of the, the feed that he feeds cattle to just to make sure that they don't have a problem. Uh, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I, I, I don't know that bloat is as big an issue as we make it out to be sometimes, but it can be an issue. Uh, he says he doesn't move cows onto to alfalfa or heavy clover fields when they're wet. He doesn't move them until afternoon, so they're dry anyway. The important point about bloat too is that we don't move animals from one field to another when they're hungry. So they're going to go out there and, and take down a bunch of that heavy leguminous wet uh, pasture, and that's when we get into bloat trouble. I don't want to want to scare you about that. It's it's just like talking about prussic acid poisoning and sorghum sedan grass. It's just something we need to be aware of. But alfalfa can be a great plant in our pasture fields. It can be a, a great part of our diversity. Uh, and I think it's important to point out this year because the alfalfa seems to grow or seems to have grown really well in the dry periods we, we experienced. Uh, I've had that slide several times in some of our updates as well. You know, as we look around our pasture fields this year, we kind of see some plants that we don't typically count on. We don't typically count on them being um, the dominant species in our pasture. I know I, I see in pasture fields that I walk a lot of fescue, a lot of bird's foot tree foil, see some alfalfa, uh, some things that we don't 
necessarily usually consider as our dominant species but these are species that did really well in the dry weather this year and 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 that goes along with our talks about diversity and diversity of our pasture field uh, we want to plant a diverse pasture field we want a diverse pasture field because in these differing times go from a wet year last year to a dry year this year it really pays dividends to have those other species out there uh, to be able to keep our pasture producing so we can talk a minute about alfalfa as well um, alfalfa is a plant that really likes higher fertility likes dry soils uh, I think we have to have phosphorus levels in the 25s and 30s to be able to really count on alfalfa. I'm saying that from my own experience because I planted alfalfa in our pasture fields. Uh, the areas that were higher fertility, alfalfa did really well. The areas that were lower fertility, it didn't do very well at all. Uh, now, as we raise the fertility in those fields, we start to see alfalfa kind of popping up. Uh, but alfalfa is a, a great producer of nitrogen. Um, it, it will produce nitrogen and then when it's grazed off, will sort of release some of that nitrogen to the grass around it. And, and that's why in a hay field, we typically see alfalfa start out as being the dominant species and, and the, the forage eventually turns to mixed grass and eventually to a grass. Both the alfalfa uh, doesn't take frequent close grazing or frequent close mowing, so it kind of kills it out, but also it's producing excess nitrogen. Uh, and that allows other grass species to grow up in our fields. But alfalfa is a, a good species to have out there in the field. I mean, we've got to be careful with it, just like clovers and, and, and everything else uh, that may cause us some bloat issue. If we keep it in that 30% of our stand sort of range, uh, we really don't have those issues with bloat. Uh, and it will produce an immense amount of not only nitrogen, but also tonnage above above ground for our livestock to consume. Alfalfa is one of those plants that, that we really bred to be a, a, an outstanding producer of forage, both in quality and tonnage. So it's a good to include in our pasture mix. Quick slide of the calves. Um, when we got out of the car, Rick said, I, I just finished weaning calves here a day or two. And it wasn't until he said that that I even heard a cow. I didn't even know where the cows were. I wasn't even sure we were at the farm where the cows were. And he had just weaned them two days ago. And um, that speaks to, to the fence line weaning that he does on his operation. And, and several of you have kind of adopted here in the last few years. Uh, but he keeps the calves uh, in this lot here around the barn for weaning. And then the cows have to walk past this lot to get to water. And so that allows the cows to go to pasture and go away from the calves, uh, but also brings them back to come back to water. And, and that's a, a very good way to wean our calves. It's lower stress. It also produces less noise. The calves aren't bawling for as long as they would if we would wean the calves off and take them to a total different place and take the cows away. Um, one thing that those of us that use fence line weaning see is that we wean them and within a day or two, they have all but quit balling altogether. Um, the cows have the opportunity to lay down on the opposite side of the fence. The, some bonding uh, activities still kind of take place. And, and we just slowly allow those cows to move away from the calves. And that's what Rick's doing here uh, with his fence line weaning. But also, put in a plug for Rick, these are bulls and heifers. Some of them heifers that he'll keep. Some of them heifers that will be for sale and bulls that... That will be for sale for for other producers to use on their cow herd <clears throat> just a picture of the laneway this is a laneway that comes down and goes past those calves that i just had in the last slide uh, and and you can see the cows up there on the hill and slowly those can cows move away panic by panic away from that weaning lot until eventually they don't they don't have to or don't want to come back at all uh, they, they've effectively been separated in. But this is a laneway as well that Rick said, when I'm planting that field to rye, I'll go ahead and plant this field, this, this laneway down to rye. And that's kind of what he does uh, every time. He said every time he has a drill hooked up and, and is in that area, he'll go ahead and plant that laneway back to, to some sort of annual forage to be able to have it grow something. Uh, but they use this laneway as well to come back to water. They use the laneway to come back to the barn to, for treatment, for run through the chute. And, and doing all the management activities that they do. As we were in our pasture walk at Rick's, uh, he said, I'd like to take you down and show you our stockpile field. 
So we went down and looked, walked around, and uh, Rick said, what do you think would be the dominant species out here in, in this stockpile? And I said, well, it's tall fescue. And he kind of looked surprised at me. And he said, you really think that tall fescue is the dominant species here? And I said, well, yeah, there's some white clover and some red clover and some orchard grass here and there. But for the most part, it's tall fescue. And he says, oh, goodness, don't tell my dad that. He'll, he'll want to kill it because he'll think it's infected fescue. So sorry, Rick, if I'm telling on you. But uh, I think it's a good point to point out that if we're going to stockpile forage for winter, uh, that tall fescue is the king of the forages. Uh, it will last longer. It will last into January, February, and even March, where orchard grass and some other grasses that we would stockpile will kind of burn out. Uh, and, and it's tough. It'll take that winter time abuse. It's got a tough, makes a tough sod uh, that will hold cows up in, in the wintertime if that's our goal and that's what we want to do. Uh, it's also good to have white clover, red clover, even alfalfa mixed in that tall fescue stand to help feed nitrogen to the tall fescue or orchard grass or whatever we may be trying to stockpile. Good to have a legume out there. Uh, one thing uh, about it too is that legume won't stockpile well on its own, but inside a good mix of tall fescue especially, but orchard grass, other grasses that we would stockpile, uh, that will tend to insulate those legumes. And so we'll uh, raise our protein level of our stockpile uh, forage through the wintertime and create an even better feed than it already was. And, and if you've been around with us for, for a long time, uh, you've seen us do forage samples on fescue or on, on stockpiled grass. I so often mix the two up together because I'm talking about fescue and stockpile. But uh, on stockpiled grass, our, our tests typically will test better than most of our dry hay that we've accumulated through the summer and we're feeding in the winter. Our stockpile grass will, will most often beat it uh, when we actually put it through a forage test. Uh, didn't feel right uh, without talking about stockpile tall fescue, without talking a little bit about the end of fight. Uh, for those of you who don't know and haven't heard that term before, I'm surprised that every day that I open up uh, different grazing publications to people that aren't, aren't familiar with uh, the endophyte, but the endophyte uh, is a, um, a part of the plant that allows it to grow. It's an actual fungus in, in the plant and allows the plant to grow and be tougher. It allows tall fescue to be what tall fescue is, a very tough plant uh, that will take a grazing abuse and keep on ticking. Um, the endophyte tends to be located in the lower portions of the plant, uh, down in that two and three inch range, uh, and also in the seed head of fescue. And so the endophyte has some detrimental effects to, to cattle. Uh, it can, it does raise their body temperature. And in the wintertime, that's not such a bad thing. In the summertime though, uh, where cows are already hot, it will raise their temperature a little higher and that's something that we don't want. And then endophyte can can um, work on the cow or the grazing animals circulation to a point that, that we can see cows that have fescue toxicity that start losing the end of their tail. They can have trouble with their feet. They, there's a condition called fescue foot uh, that they kind of lose the circulation to their feet. But as with the bloat that I was talking about earlier, uh, it's really not a problem if we've got a mix of forages out there. And that's why it's important to also have those legumes and other grasses in among that fescue uh, to be able to make sure that they, the livestock are consuming a mix. I'll also say that uh, in my operation, uh, my cows will avoid, my sheep too, will avoid tall fescue. August, September, October, those hotter months of the year. Uh, they will avoid it almost completely and they'll come back to it once it freezes, once it frosts, uh, once it gets cold, they'll come back and graze that tall fescue then after that. So uh, important points to point out about grazing stockpile. I, I love to have a pasture walk here in October and, and if we had them in November and December typically uh, with stockpiled tall fescue or even stockpiled grass in general. Uh, just to show that there are ways for us to to extend that grazing season, that the gra grazing season and the growing season don't have to be the same time. But 
a, a good version of stockpile pasture to use to extend our grazing season. Well, that's a wrap for this month's Pasture Walk. We do want to send out a heartfelt thank you to Mr. Rick Horner and his family for showing us around their operation, hosting us to take pictures and videos and, and look at what they've got going on. We surely do appreciate it. Now, for all of you who have spent time with us and, and been to in-person Pasture Walks, you realize that it is now October, and that is when we typically end our Pasture Walk season. Uh, but this year, because everything was different. Uh, we did virtual pasture walks through the entire season and it is Beth and I's hope that we will continue to put together updates for the months of November and December. Even though we typically don't hold in-person meetings November and December uh, because of the holidays and all the things that go along with that, uh, we are really hoping to put together updates for December, December and November. Uh, and then uh, we started discussions and talks about how we're going to handle January and February and March when we typically do in-person educational type meetings. Uh, but as all things, uh, we're going to just have to see how, how things are going when we get to that time. But we are planning on still holding um, January and February and March, some educational type meetings, whether they have to be virtual or whether they'll be in-person meetings. But we're going to work on that here in the next month or so. But I will say, if you've got any topics that you're interested in hearing more about, that you want us to cover in educational type meetings, we would be glad to hear from you. We'd be glad to hear what topics you're interested in hearing about. Uh, so as we put those either in-person or virtual meetings together for January, February, and March, uh, we've got some additional topics. That would be great. So with that, I'll say we'll see you next time.